Hi everyone. I did a live stream a while back, and during that video, someone asked me to talk more about the history of the sitar. At the time, I spoke briefly as I didn't want to present false information. So this video is about answering that question in full. This is the history of the sitar. The majority of my information will be coming from seven books. My Music, My Life by Pandachi Ravi Shankar, The Sitar, The Instrument and Its Technique by Manfred M. Junis. These are um, both great books that I would recommend. I also referenced Learning the Sitar by David Courtney, a respected tabla player, Sitar and Sarod in the 18th and 19th centuries by Alan Minor, Sitar Technique in Niba da Forms by Stephen M. Salwick, The Journey of the Sitar in Indian Classical Music by Dr. Swarm Lata, and finally, the Dictionary of Hindustani Classical Music by Bhima Lakata Roy Chowdhury. The very first sitar has been lost to time, but most stories will attribute its creation to Amir Kushrao, a musician, poet, and statesman who served in the court of Sultan Aluddin Khalji of Delhi in the 13th century. Amir Kushrao's fame and his contributions to the development of Indian music are well established, but did he really create the sitar? Panushi Ravi Shankar writes in his book, and I quote, It is an undeniable fact that Amir Kushrao did make certain alterations and give the instrument a new name, Setar, Persian for three-stringed. When Panduchi wrote those words in 1968, that may have been the accepted truth. But contemporary research fleshes out the history a bit more, and it gets complicated. First off, David Courtney points out how if the sitar was invented in the 13th century, why are there no depictions or indications of it actually existing until much later? Many point to a second musician in the 18th century, also named Amir Kushrao, who is believed to be the grandson of legendary musician Tan Sen. In an era when oral histories were popular for preserving information, it explains the blurring between the legendary 13th century singer and a different musician some five centuries later. In his own book, Ravi Shankar notes that the gap in the sitar's development between the 13th and 18th century is also sort of a bit suspicious. He also points out that the legend of the 13th century Amir Kushrao has been glorified by historians, and he has been, and this is a quote, given credit for many things he really did not bring about. But by the 18th century, the sitar does definitely exist. 1719 is the first documented mention of the sitar by name in a court ledger by Farooq Shah where it is described as having six or seven strings. The Persian sitar is the instrument that I've always thought was the foundation of the modern sitar, and as quoted earlier, Ravi Shankar references this correlation as well. The question is then, like, well, what about the Persian sitar? Well, ironically, the Persian sitar, a name that literally means three strings, has changed over the years, and now that instrument contains four strings. Visually, the setar and the sitar do have a few common elements. Um, the frets of both instruments are tied, and the tuning pegs and the string layout have a similar placement for the main playing string compared to the placement on a contemporary North Indian bina. So while the word sitar may have come from the Persian for three strings, setar, I saw little evidence in the published research to suggest that the sitar actually evolved from the Persian setar. I think they both just happen to have the same name. Maybe they both started with three strings. But the tempura, this is an instrument with many similarities to the sitar in terms of construction. Looking at the tempura in the sitar, well, I think you can kind of see the common design. Before the tempura became the instrument we know today, there were similar unfretted instruments, and their development can actually be followed in artwork from the 10th century onward. By the 16th century, they developed into the form that we know today. Eventually, instruments like the tempura, the rudravina, or bean, and the jantar, sort of a smaller bean, would cross paths. Now, I'm not trying to sound flippant or stupid about this, but if I played a tempura, and then I saw someone playing a rudravina, I don't think it's sort of a huge jump for me to go home and sort of, as an experiment, say, mm, let, me, let me tie some frets to the neck of this and see what would happen. <laughs> So the sitar seems to be a mix of instruments with no clear creator, and even now there are differences in how a sitar is built, depending on the performer's karana or their own stylistic modifications. This is an instrument that has continued to evolve over the last 100 years. So let's talk about what we do know. 
I feel it is important to mention uh, Masit Khan. The specific details of Masit Khan's life are vague, but Alan Minor estimates that he lived between the mid 1700s and the first quarter of the 19th century. In some of the other research I did, Masit is believed to be the grandson of the second Amir Khusrau uh, from the 18th century, the second Amir Khusrau. But it is considered a fact that he brought the sitar to a new level of prominence through the use of Drupad and his influence made the sitar a solo instrument and that is a really, really big deal. Prior to this, the sitar was just a background accompaniment to vocal performances. His influence on the instrument is with us today in the style known as Mastakani Gut and his disciple Raza Khan gave us the Raza Khani Baj. In the 18th century, a treatise by the Maharaja Swari Pratap Singh of Jaipur describes the sitar as having, quote, a cut gourd attached to one end of a wooden neck with frets tied to the neck in places of the swaras or notes. The instrument is described as having four, five, or even six strings. So even then, we see that there is variation in its final form. Imdad Khan is our next big name. Born in 1848, he is credited with improving the Jawari or bridge adding sympathetic tarab strings and reducing the number of frets. Doing so allowed the player to more freely bend notes and use mean. And it is around this time that the sitar that we think of today with the full repertoire of a lop, jor, gut, and jala, thanks to the addition of chakari strings, came into fashion. Imdad Khan also made the earliest known recordings of the sitar between 1905 and 1910. His son, Enyat Khan, became one of the most sought-after sitars of his generation, and along with his son, Ustad Vilyat Khan, they expanded the popularity of the sitar and incorporated additional changes. For example, lessening the number of strings and expanding on the use of mind and gamak. They are often credited with pushing the vocal qualities of the sitar to its zenith. Panditji Ravi Shankar's contribution is also huge due to the influence he had in bringing the instrument to a global audience. Although many musicians like Vilyat Khan would also tour the globe extensively, Ravi Shankar had the unique experience where he spent much of his youth in France performing music in his brother Uday's dance troupe. This gave him a pretty unique insight into Western culture, Western music, and just what a Western audience is expecting. After George Harrison played sitar on the Beatles song Norwegian Wood and subsequently became Shankar's student, Ravi's celebrity status shot through the roof. Tasked with being the unofficial ambassador for Hindustani classical music, he spread his message both with his outstanding virtuosity and by educating his audiences with easily digestible and entertaining explanations of the music. In addition, Panachi Ravi Shankar added two bass strings to his sitar to expand the range of lower notes, something you can hear during his allot performances. What's next for the sitar? I don't know, but I do know it is, it is time for me to go and practice. Researching the information for this video was intense and I learned a lot and hopefully you did too. If I missed something or I misstated a fact, please let me know, leave a comment. I also really, really, really hope that I pronounced every name correctly, no disrespect if I got anything wrong. If you like this video and you want to see similar content, please click on the subscribe button you could also visit me on Patreon, Crowdfunding for Creatives, where you can help support the creation of more videos like this one. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.